Okay. So uh, thank you everybody for coming to our Monday seminar at the IFT. Today we are uh, honored to have with us uh, Matt Rees from uh, Harvard University, who has agreed to uh, take us on a Swamblan tour from global symmetries to action physics. So remember that uh, to stay muted as much as you can, you can interrupt at any time, uh, just unmute yourself and ask the question. And uh, okay, so over to you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was originally planning to be in Madrid at this time, so it's a pity that I can't actually be there in person, but it's good to see all of you virtually. Um, so I'm going to talk about various things I've been working on uh, related to the Swampland. Uh, this work is done with, in collaboration with Ben Heidenreich, uh, who's a professor at UMass Amherst, and Tom Redelius, who's a postdoc at the IAS. I've been working with them for about five years now. Um, but I'll also tell you about some work in progress that also involves Jake McNamara, who's a student of Cameron Baffa at Harvard, and Miguel Montero and Irene Valenzuela, who are now postdocs at Harvard and who were students at the IFT, so I think they're familiar to, to many of you. And um, this is the outline of the talk. I'll, I'll start by making some general remarks about the Swampland and the weak gravity conjecture. Um, then I want to talk about the idea of generalized global symmetries, which was introduced by Gaioto and collaborators about uh, five or six years ago. Um, but I'll try to give an, an introduction to it for those of you who might not be familiar. And then I'll discuss some of this ongoing work uh, where we try to apply this idea of generalized global symmetries, uh, in particular to what we're calling churn bay symmetries, uh, which we hope might shed some light on axion physics and, and so hopefully have some phenomenological implications. And the Swampland program, um, I, I know is very familiar to some of you who've been working extensively on it, but for those of you who might be less familiar, let me, let me review it a little bit. Uh, the idea of the Swampland is that um, we know that there are many different consistent quantum field theories, uh, but it seems that not all of them can be embedded in string theory. Um, so when we try to find consistent theories of quantum gravity, we, we find some isolated uh, vacua, we find some moduli spaces where there are continuous parameters that we can dial using the webs of scalar fields. Um, but at least so far, we only know how to, how to cover sort of a small fraction of the space of all effective field theories with consistent theories of quantum gravity. And in fact, we think that there are big classes of effective field theories um, that cannot be UV completed in quantum gravity. And, and uh, so the swampland is defined to be those theories that can't be UV completed. It's a name that came from, from Kamran Vafa in 2005. And the goal of the Swampland program is to try to find some concrete criteria that can separate between theories that at least have a chance of being UV completed and theories that do not. And um, I come at this from the direction of, of particle phenomenology. That's what my background is. Um, and, and one reason why I, I think that there's potential hope for applying these things to phenomenology is that uh, when you look at what has happened in, in string theory constructions of quantum field theories, there are many different kinds of constructions in different corners of the string landscape, heterotic strings, type two strings, and, and so on. But they all seem to have some common features. Um, so one of those features that I'll be talking about later in this talk is that axions always, always exist. So anytime uh, people find some construction of say a standard model like theory, a, a gauge theory, uh, within quantum gravity, um, there's always some light scalar field that couples to the trace of F wedge F and obtains a mass from instanton effect. So that's a very interesting statement phenomenologically if we knew that axions had to exist in quantum gravity. Um, another thing you find is that uh, you don't find very light massive photons, things with small Stuckelberg masses. So that's another topic I've thought about that I won't say much about in this talk, uh, but it's a phenomenologically interesting claim that comes out of string theory. Um, another extremely interesting claim that comes out of string theory is that chiral matter only tends to come in small representations of the gauge group. So in quantum field theory, it's consistent to write down big representations, three index tensors, four index tensors, and it's very hard to find those things in consistent theories of quantum gravity. Um, it's rare to find scalar potentials that are flat over distances bigger than the Planck scale in field space in quantum gravity. Again, that's a very interesting statement because it constrains a lot of potential models of inflation. Um, Aside from axions, there are also scalar moduli. Um, and there are more things we could enumerate that are observations about string vacua. And so the question that I find very interesting in the subject is um, 
are, are these facts about string vacua just consequences of kind of looking under the lamppost at theories that are easy to construct? Or are there deep principles behind them? Are, are these things that we can expect to be true in any theory of quantum gravity, even the theories of quantum gravity that we have not yet been able to explicitly construct? And, um, and if there are, then that's very interesting for phenomenology because some of these things are you know, very concretely testable and might rule out uh, certain models of physics beyond the standard model or might better motivate other models of physics beyond the standard model. And so in this talk, I'm, I'm going to focus on one small part of this broader picture of the swampland, um, which is the idea that there are no global symmetries in theories of quantum gravity. And, and the weak gravity conjecture is kind of a sharper version of, of that statement. And what I want to do toward the end of the talk is tell you about some of this ongoing work where we think that some version of this idea of no global symmetries might actually be what's at the root of the observation that string constructions always have axions in them. And that's related to what we call churn vague global symmetries. But before I explain that, I need to spend some time introducing the idea of generalized global symmetries, which comes from Gaioto, Kapustin, Seiberg, and Willett. And so it's a bit formal, um, but so I'll spend some time just talking in general about quantum field theory and, and introducing this idea of generalized global symmetries. Um, but I think that ultimately these ideas really will have applications to real world particle physics already. Um, many of these ideas are used by condensed matter theorists um, to talk about topological phases of matter. And so I think even though some of the things I say might seem a little bit formal, I think they really are very relevant for the real world. Okay, so the idea that quantum gravity doesn't have any global symmetries is an old idea. It goes back uh, at least to the 80s. Um, where there's a simple argument on the string world sheet that if you think you have a continuous global symmetry, you can actually see that there's a gauge boson that couples to it. And so it really wasn't a global symmetry at all. It was gauged. Uh, but there are more general arguments that, that are not uh, just limited in context to particular corners of the string landscape. For example, um, there's an argument that uh, black holes uh, don't seem compatible with continuous global symmetries. And the argument there is that if I have a black hole and I have a global symmetry, I can imagine throwing stuff that's charged under the global symmetry into the black hole and make a very big black hole that has a very big global symmetry charge. And then Hawking's calculation of, of black hole evaporation tells us this black hole will gradually shrink. Um, it will emit particles. But because there's no external field associated with the global symmetry, there's no preference for emitting things with one charge or the other charge. And so the charge of the black hole will kind of random walk as the black hole becomes smaller. Um, but if you start with a very big black hole with a very big charge, you will end up with a very big charge remaining um, when the black hole becomes of order the cutoff size where we can no longer trust Hawking's calculation to tell us what happens. And so the argument then, um, which has been nicely written down by Banks and Seiberg, is that um, if you consider black holes whose size is of order the cutoff, um, they can, in principle, have arbitrarily large charge under a global symmetry uh, by this argument. If we just start with a sufficiently big thing, we can end up with a small black hole that has an arbitrarily big charge. And that means there are infinitely many different black hole states of this particular size that have different charges. And that leads to all kinds of problems with black hole thermodynamics and, and making sense of the usual uh, thermodynamic and holographic kinds of arguments about how black holes should behave. So that's one argument why we should not expect to find any exact continuous global symmetries in theories of quantum gravity. Um, and recently that, that argument has been strengthened. So there was a, uh, a set of two papers by Daniel Harlow and Hiroshi Oguri, uh, one short paper and then one very long paper with all of the details that uh, basically prove in the context of asymptotically ADS theories of quantum gravity, um, that there can be no global symmetries. And that's a much stronger statement than just no continuous global symmetries. It also includes discrete global symmetries. And it includes the generalized p-form symmetries that I'm going to tell you more about later in the talk. And I'm not going to try to, to review their argument in any detail, but uh, basically it involves kind of first being very careful about how to define a global symmetry. Because if you're not careful, there are sort of pathological counterexamples to the statement, but they're somehow not very interesting examples of symmetries. Any symmetry that really behaves the way we expect a symmetry to behave in quantum field theory has a property that they call splitability, which means you can sort of restrict the symmetry generators to act in a particular region. 
And what they show is if you can kind of factor your symmetry operators into small enough regions on the boundary, then by the idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction, they can't probe the entire bulk and you can derive a contradiction. Okay, so they give a very, a very precise argument. Um, it's limited to the asymptotically ADS context, but still it's sort of an encouraging um, step in the direction of giving us a completely general derivation of this fact that there are no global symmetries of any kind in theories of quantum gravity. Now, saying that there are no global symmetries by itself is not a very useful statement because it says there are no exact global symmetries, but we know that, uh, for instance, in the standard model, in the real world, we have lots of approximate symmetries and they're very useful. So things like why the pion is light compared to um, other bound states in QCD, that depends on having approximate global symmetries. And so what you would really like to know is not just can there be global symmetries, but um, if there cannot be, then how close can we get? How good an approximation can we have to a global symmetry? And that's what motivated the weak gravity conjecture, um, which investigates the question of what happens if I have a very weakly coupled gauge theory? So I approach a global symmetry by starting with something that's gauged and dialing down the gauge coupling to be very small. Um, and they suggested a few things that should happen. One is that there should be some particle whose mass is less than its charge in appropriate units and Planck units. Um, and kinematically, that's just the condition that an extremal black hole can decay. So black holes always have mass bigger than their charge in appropriate units. Uh, but the weak gravity conjecture says that some particle exists that obeys the opposite inequality and that would allow an extremal black hole to shed its charge. Uh, an equivalent statement in the context of theories without massless scalars is that there's some particle that when you take two copies of the particle, it repels itself because the gauge interaction from the charge is stronger than gravity. That's why it's called the weak gravity conjecture. Um, so gauge repulsion overcomes gravitational attraction. If there are massless scalars, the massless scalars can mediate an additional attractive interaction. And if the massless scalars couple differently to particles than black holes, these are actually two different conjectures. Um, so Ben and Tom and I propose that we call the latter one the repulsive force conjecture and the original one the weak gravity conjecture, uh, just to keep track of which one is which. Um, although there's, there's some evidence, um, and this has been discussed in recent years by Palti and by Lee, Lersch, and Wagen, that, that uh, maybe both of these things are, are true um, in theories of quantum gravity. But the weak gravity conjecture, again, like the statement that there are no global symmetries, is not a very useful statement. And the reason it's not very useful is it just says something exists with mass less than its charge. It doesn't say it has to be a light particle within the effective field theory. It's just some object. Um, and in particular, there's increasing evidence in the last few years that this is actually obeyed by black holes. And the reason is that the statement that the black hole mass is bigger than its charge, the extremality bound, is really only a statement in GR with the two derivative action. And so if you start doing effective field theory beyond the leading order, you have higher derivative terms, they change the mass to charge relationship of black holes and they potentially allow the black holes to be a little bit lighter or maybe require them to be a little bit heavier than um, the two derivative action. And there's a lot of evidence that general principles like unitarity and causality actually constrain the size of these corrections, sorry, the sign of these corrections um, to be such that the black holes can be a little bit lighter than the extremality bound. And that means black holes themselves obey the weak gravity conjecture and so the minimal weak gravity conjecture is not very useful because, um, you know, as a particle physicist, why do I care if it's just telling me that there's some tiny correction to a big black hole? That's not a very useful statement. Um, but what's been happening over the last five years or so is that, is that a lot of us have been um, trying to think about whether there's some stronger statement that actually is useful. And, um, some naive statements like you might say, maybe, maybe the weak gravity conjecture should apply to the lightest charged particle. Some of these things are now known to be false. They're counterexamples. Um, but there's another idea which was in the original weak gravity conjecture paper, which is that what happens is not just that there has to be a light particle, but that there's a UV cutoff. And in fact, that's, that's been the flavor of a lot of the swampland ideas um, that seem most powerful in recent years, is they tell you, not that you're not allowed to have something happen, but that if you try to get it to happen, there's a bound on the UV cutoff of the theory. When you make some demand of your IR theory, there's some correlation between that and the UV cutoff. Um, and in the context of the weak gravity conjecture, that's what's sometimes called the magnetic weak gravity conjecture, the statement that the, the UV cutoff of the theory becomes smaller when we make the gauge coupling small. 
And so if I try to send the gauge coupling to zero to restore a global symmetry, um, then my UV cutoff comes all the way down to zero and I can't do effective field theory anymore. And that's the mechanism by which quantum gravity prevents us from having uh, an exact global symmetry. And um, there's increasing evidence that uh, the way that this comes about, at least in examples that we understand, is that there's not just one particle that obeys the weak gravity bound, but there's an infinite tower of particles of different charges, which are light, they're part of the effective field theory, and, um, and they all obey the bound, and when you integrate them out, they run in loops. And so in the infrared, you have a weakly coupled theory, but as you go to the UV, you see more and more of the particles in this tower, and as they run in loops, they drive you to strong coupling, they make your amplitudes blow up, and you can talk about this either from two-point functions or higher point functions. You've got similar kinds of scaling arguments. Um, and this is reflected in, in various ideas called tower weak gravity conjectures or sublattice weak gravity conjectures um, that have been proposed by various people. And in the last few years, there's also been a lot of evidence um, uh, exploring how these things happen in string theory and prove that in basically every corner of the string landscape that is understood, this happens. So whenever you have a weak gauge coupling, it's weak because you've integrated out a large number of states and they drive it to strong coupling in the UV um, at the scale where quantum gravity becomes strongly coupled. And in fact, there's even been a very recent proposal by Wheeler and Weigand of a very sharp version of this idea <clears throat> which says that whenever you have a weak coupling in string theory, basically there are only two ways to get it. Either it's a decompactification limit, so you have some kaluza klein theory and you're making some internal volume big, and so lots of kaluza klein modes are becoming light, or it's a tensionless string limit where maybe you have some uh, internal geometry where you can wrap some object to get a string, and that object, that, that internal volume is becoming small, and so the string that's wrapped on it is becoming very, very light and tensionless and you get lots of light string modes. So, um, so in principle, a lot of these conjectures are compatible with many different kinds of towers of particles. In practice, the towers seem to be only of those two types, either kaluza klein modes or modes of a light, uh, a low tension string. Um, so that's been the development of the weak gravity conjecture. It's been, the, the original version has been put on a sounder footing by these black hole arguments, but it's too weak to be useful. Uh, but we've also made a lot of progress in recent years towards stronger versions. Um, and, and there's increasing amounts of evidence in string theory for those stronger versions. Although there's not the kind of very general argument about black holes that we might like to have to really prove it from first principles. Okay, so that has been uh, one of the central kinds of ideas that people have been thinking about in the context of um, the Swampland program in the last five years. Um, but I think there's still a lot of progress to be made in that direction, but I think there are also other directions that we can push the Swampland program. And I think a lot of those are going to rely on this uh, field theory idea of generalized global symmetries. And so in the next portion of the talk, I want to just review the idea of generalized global symmetries and then try to connect it back to the idea of the weak gravity conjecture. And in the third part of the talk, this idea of generalized global symmetries will, will play a key role in um, explaining some new ideas about swampland constraints. Okay, um, so this idea of generalized global symmetries, as I mentioned, comes from work of Gaioto and collaborators. Uh, it's about uh, a little more than five years old. Um, and um, this language might be kind of unfamiliar. So what I wanna do is first discuss ordinary global symmetries um, just in a language that's similar to the language that they use. And once I've done that, we can then introduce the more general version of the story. And then we can come back to the Swampland and see how these ideas relate to the Swampland program. So before I talk about global symmetries, I should just review what differential forms are for those of you who may not be familiar with this uh, kind of notation. A differential P form is just an anti-symmetric tensor with P indices. And the nice thing about differential forms is the things that you can integrate over manifolds. So examples that show up a lot in physics are things like a gauge field, a mu, can be written as a one form, a mu dx mu. And that's something you can integrate over the world line of a charged particle. Um, and it's how you define a Wilson line operator, for instance, in terms of this one form. There's a two form, which is the field strength, which is the 
um, anti-symmetric object f mu nu, uh, dx mu wedge dx nu. This wedge is just an anti-symmetrized uh, tensor product. And this is something you can integrate over a two-dimensional manifold. And in particular, uh, that integral of f um, is what measures the magnetic flux through a two-dimensional sphere. And in four dimensions, um, you can surround a magnetic monopole with a two-dimensional sphere and measure its magnetic flux. In five dimensions, a magnetic monopole is actually a string-like object. And again, you can have a sphere that surrounds that string, and you can integrate, and so on in higher dimensions. Um, Similarly, we can write the electric flux as an integral of a different object, which is called star f, uh, which is what you get when you take the field strength and you contract it with an anti-symmetric uh, epsilon symbol, the levi chivita tensor. Um, and again, in four dimensions, you can just integrate this thing. So this is basically f tilde, the dual of f. You integrate it over a, a sphere around an electrically charged object, and you measure the electric charge. Um, in higher dimensions, you integrate over higher dimensional spheres that surround point-like charged objects, and you measure their electric charge. Now, when we, when we talk about differential forms, there's a useful operation on them, which is taking what's called the exterior derivative, which is written with a d. And d of a differential form just takes one partial derivative uh, with a different index than all the indices the tensor has, and it's anti-symmetrized. So again, it's contracted with this anti-symmetrized combination. Um, because it's anti-symmetrized, if I take d of d of something, I always get zero. Um, and there's some mathematical uh, jargon to introduce here, which is that if d of a differential form is zero, we call it a closed form. If a differential form is d of something else, um, if there's some p minus one form b that c is a d is d of, uh, we say that c is exact. All exact forms are closed because d of d of anything is zero, but not all closed forms are exact. And the uh, quotient of the space of closed forms by the exact forms is what we call the, the cohomology. Now, um, this notion of closed form is useful because it's just what we, what we talk about in physics as a conserved object. Um, so in particular, we're used to writing conservation laws of a current by saying the partial derivative contracted with j is 0. But we could also define an object, let me call it capital J, to distinguish the notation, which is the dual of the usual current. So it's an anti-symmetric epsilon symbol contracted with the current. And then the fact that the divergence of the current is 0 is equivalent to saying that d of this uh, dual object j, which has d minus 1 indices, is 0. Uh, so conserved currents are just the same thing as closed differential forms. And we know that we can measure the total charge in a quantum field theory by integrating the time component of a current over all of space. Uh, but equivalently, we can integrate this d minus 1 form, capital J, just directly over any d minus 1 dimensional manifold uh, contained in spacetime. And so it's useful to think about charges being associated with any co-dimension one submanifold of our spacetime. Um, and we know that we can gauge a conserved current. So if I have a global symmetry with a local conserved current, I can gauge it by writing down an A mu J mu term where A is a gauge field. But in the notation of differential forms, that's just A, the one form gauge field, wedge capital J, the D minus one form conserved current. And we can also rewrite Maxwell's equations in this language where they tell us that d of the uh, electric flux current star f is capital J, the, the current uh, dual to j mu. And what you see from this is that um, once we gauge our symmetry, once I add this a wedge j term, what Maxwell's equations tell us is j is no longer just conserved. It's better than conserved. It's exact, because it's now d of something else. So within a gauge theory, what would have been just a closed form, if we didn't gauge it, becomes an exact form. So one way to think about what gauging does is it removes something from the cohomology. It makes it trivial in cohomology by making it exact. And I haven't been very careful about putting in all the square roots of g and everything, but, but the equations I've written here on the right are all the correct equations, if you are careful. OK. Um, 
So all of those statements were kind of classical, but we can also talk about quantum mechanical statements. So I said that we could define a charge by integrating a current over a co-dimension one manifold. But in the quantum theory, what we really have are operators associated with this charge. And we can define a family of operators, um, which are labeled by two things. One is a manifold that we integrate over, so a d minus one dimensional submanifold in spacetime. And the other is a, if, if I imagine my symmetry is u1, it's a phase alpha. More generally, it's an element of the group uh, that I have for my global symmetry. So here I'm imagining a u1 global symmetry, elements of u1 I can write as e to the i alpha, and I'm labeling these operators by alpha. And the definition of this operator is just take that integral over the um, manifold and take e to the i alpha times that integral. Okay, so the goal is basically to have an operator that when, um, when this manifold surrounds something charged, you pick up a phase that's e to the i alpha q, where q is the charge of the thing that the, that's surrounded by m. And these operators are topological, uh, meaning their correlation functions don't care if I take this m and I squish it and deform it, as long as that operation of deforming it doesn't cross the manifold through some charged point particle. Okay, so if I have um, some charged local operator under this U1 symmetry, and I move that operator across this manifold to the other side, I pick up a phase, and the phase measures the charge of the operator. Okay, um, so this is just another way to talk about what we're used to with global symmetries. We still have, I'm still talking about a U1 symmetry, I'm still talking about it acting on local operators. Um, the action on local operators gives them a phase. All of this is kind of familiar, but the reason to phrase it in this more general language about submanifolds um, is that this, this is useful for broader kinds of symmetries. So for instance, if I have a discrete symmetry, if I have a Z2 symmetry or a Z5 symmetry or something even more complicated but still discrete, um, I can't write down a conserved current anymore. And so naively, you might say it acts on local operators, but there's no local action of the group. Uh, there's no local operator that's the analog of J mu. Nonetheless, there are these operators that are localized on submanifolds. And so I can still talk about a discrete symmetry acting locally by building some little manifold and building one of these U operators for the discrete symmetry. And that's a well-defined thing, even though there isn't a local current. So that's one way, that's one reason it's useful to generalize the notion of symmetries in this way. And what Gaioto and collaborators pointed out is that once you make this generalization, there's a further generalization that's very useful. Um, and it defines what are called p-form symmetries, p-form global symmetries. Um, and I should say that uh, the gauge versions of these are well understood. In, in string theory, there are these higher form p-form gauge fields. And people have been comfortably working with those for decades. Uh, but somehow the global symmetry version of this was not very well studied until uh, the last several years after this paper of Geigos and collaborators. So um, the more general version, what I've been telling you about is an ordinary symmetry, which we call a zero form symmetry. It acts on local operators, which are zero dimensional objects. A P form symmetry has charge operators that are associated with, rather than co-dimension one, co-dimension P plus one submanifold. So they're localized on lower dimensional slices of space time. And the things that carry charge under this live on p-dimensional manifolds. So for instance, a one-form symmetry doesn't act on local operators, it acts on line operators. So like a Wilson line or Wilson loop is something that could be charged under a one-form symmetry. And the reason for this relationship, p-dimensional objects and co-dimension p plus one submanifolds, is that those things can be linked. So just as a sphere in four dimensions can surround a point like object, a d minus p minus one dimensional manifold in d dimensions can be linked with a p dimensional object. So there's a topological notion of what it means for that thing to move from the inside to the outside of this manifold. And just as a, a local operator for an ordinary global symmetry can create a particle that carries charge, here are these p dimensional charged operators can create p plus one dimensional world volumes of charged things, so like a Wilson loop like operator that lives on a line could create a string that uh, kind of propagates outward in space-time from that line. 
And if the group is continuous, we can always define this in terms of some local conserved current that we integrate to get these operators U. Uh, but more generally, this can be defined for discrete things. Um, the fact that it's a group is reflected in some multiplication law. If I have these things defined for different group elements, I can multiply them together and get the operator defined on the product of the group elements. Again, they're topological. I can bend the, the, the manifolds without um, changing the correlation functions as long as they don't cross through charged objects. And it turns out that um, somehow the case we're familiar with of ordinary global symmetries is in some ways the most complicated case because these symmetries can be defined for any group. Um, whereas these higher dimensional p-form symmetries um, are always abelian. And that's just kind of a topological property. Um, it's the fact that the ordinary symmetries live on co-dimension one submanifolds. And so if I have two different ones um, and I want one to kind of cross inside the other, I can't do it without just directly making them cross. But if we have these higher dimensional things, say I, I have sort of two circles, I can move them around each other without intersecting. And so the order in which they act doesn't matter and the symmetry has to be abelian. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, show you a few more slides uh, explaining this. And, and several of my next slides are, are taken from a talk actually that Tom Rodelius gave in Madrid. So some of you may have been there. I apologize if you're hearing the same thing twice. Um, but I think quite a few of you were probably not there. Um, so the, um, right. So again, we, we have sort of some charged object. We have a, uh, an operator that measures this charge living on some submanifold and that's topological. And so if we imagine sort of shrinking that manifold that surrounds this object and we pick up a phase and that phase depends on the representation of the group. And all of this has been kind of abstract. So maybe it's better if I give you an example. And my example, I'm going to talk about an ordinary U1 gauge theory. So just the theory of a photon. And for now, let's imagine there are no charged objects, no electrons, no magnetic monopoles, nothing that carries either electric or magnetic charge. And so we're talking about a gauge theory, a U1 gauge theory, but that theory also has global symmetries. And they're not ordinary global symmetries. They're these new higher dimensional kinds of symmetries. And they follow from these two equations. The first is just Maxwell's equation, DE of star F is zero. So star F is a closed form. And again, that's true only because I said there are no charged objects. Otherwise there would have been a J on the right-hand side. The other equation is that DF is zero. And again, that's true only because I said there are no magnetically charged objects. Otherwise there would have been a J for magnetic monopoles on the right-hand side. But if I tell you there are no charged objects, then this tells us that there are two different conserved things, F and star F. And it turns out they both generate U1 symmetries, but these are not ordinary symmetries. They're one form symmetries and D minus three form symmetries respectively. And in four dimensions, those are both one form. And the objects that are charged under the symmetry star F, which I'll call the electric one form symmetry are just Wilson loops. And the objects that are charged under the magnetic symmetry are just a tuff loops. Okay, so this talk about all these manifolds and everything is maybe kind of abstract, but concretely, what are these symmetries doing? They're just counting Wilson loops or tuff loops. And the idea is that, uh, you know, Wilson loops are conserved in the sense that if I have a Wilson loop and there are no charged objects, I can't kind of break it open. It's just there and I can count how many of them there are. On the other hand, if there are charged particles, we explicitly break the symmetry because now there's a J on the right hand side. So star F is no longer closed. And what does that mean? Well, it means a Wilson line can end on a charged operator. Um, and that means we no longer have this kind of topological character because I can take my sphere that surrounds my Wilson line and I can just kind of slide it off the end. And now there's no charge thing that it surrounds. Um, and so the, the endability of the Wilson lines, the fact that they can end on a local operator uh, is the same thing as saying the symmetry is explicitly broken. Okay. Um, Maybe I should pause for just a second here to ask if there are any questions about this before I move on. Uh, hi, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the setup that you described uh, is only for uh, E1 symmetry where the U1 is compact uh, and that does not hold for, uh, true for uh, non-compact U1, right? That's right. So what, when I say U1, I mean compact. If it was non-compact, okay. I would call it R. But yes, you're right. If, if you have a non-compact abelian symmetry, 
then, then this would not be true anymore. Yeah, well, in fact, I mean, there would still be symmetries to talk about, but they wouldn't be U1 global symmetries anymore. Um, yeah, so, so, so I always have in mind uh, compact U1 symmetry, which means in particular that there could be magnetic monopoles. I'm just assuming that there aren't for the moment. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so, so what I've shown you is that um, a U1 gauge theory with no charged objects has a new global symmetry. And we've said that quantum gravity doesn't like global symmetries, right? So how does quantum gravity get rid of these symmetries that would be there if I just had a photon? Well, it gets rid of them by adding things to the right-hand side of these equations so that the conservation laws are not true anymore. Okay, so if there are charged electric objects, then star F is not conserved. If there are magnetic monopoles, then F is not conserved. And so if we have electrically and magnetically charged particles, we don't have these global symmetries. And that means we, we haven't violated the no global symmetry statement. So that tells us that we expect quantum gravity to have these charged objects. Um, but again, that's a pretty minimal statement. We want something stronger. And um, there's some nice forthcoming work by Clay Cordova, Kantaro Amori, and Tom Rudelius that actually shows how to get something stronger out of this. And what they say is, we said that charged particles break the symmetry, but how badly do they break it? You know, is it a badly broken symmetry or is it a mildly broken symmetry? Um, and so the nice insight that they had is there's a concrete way to formulate what it means to talk about a one form symmetry being mildly broken or badly broken. And the concrete thing is to say, well, there are these correlation functions between these operators that measure charge and the charge things, which are topological if the symmetry is unbroken. And if the symmetry is broken, they're not topological. And so they propose to try to measure how topological is the correlation function. Well, what does that mean? One way to define it is to say, let's start with some charged object like a Wilson loop, surround that Wilson loop by a sphere that measures its charge. Um, and now let's calculate the correlation function as we vary the size of the sphere. And if it was topological, we can just keep shrinking or expanding the sphere and we'll always get the same answer. We'll pick up some phase and the phase measures the charge of the Wilson loop. However, if the theory is not topological, this phase is no longer just something that depends on the charge, it's something that depends on the size of the sphere. And what we can do is measure how quickly is that correlation function changing. And so one way to measure that is to ask, what's the logarithmic derivative of this phase with respect to the radius of the sphere? And so what they suggest is we should say the symmetry, the one form symmetry that the Wilson loops are charged under, the symmetry that just counts Wilson loops, is an approximate symmetry at the length scale r if this delta is small. And it's a badly broken symmetry if this delta is an order one number. Okay. So if there are charged objects, we can no longer just count Wilson loops because you can break open Wilson loops on the charged particles. But you might still be able to approximately count Wilson loops. Um, and that's what this is trying to measure. And they make a hypothesis, and, and related statements have been made by other people. So for instance, I want to point out a recent paper by Fichet and Saraswat that gives a nice discussion of, of this idea that global symmetries and quantum gravity should not just be broken, but somehow badly broken. But the, the, the formulation that Cordova and collaborators are using is that they want to say all global symmetries have to be badly broken at the UV cutoff scale of quantum gravity. So if you're an IR observer, they might be really good. And we know that there are good approximate symmetries in the IR, you know, baryon number in our universe, other, other things are good approximate symmetries. But they want to say, as you get close to the cutoff, where gravity becomes strongly coupled, then these symmetries should be badly broken. And in this context, you can just figure out what that means, because you can ask, what causes this radius dependence? What makes this not topological? And the answer is loops. So these correlation functions, these operators are just built out of field strengths and gauge fields. So you can just compute them perturbatively. And basically, what you find yourself doing when you try to work this out is just computing the two-point function of the photon. And the thing that makes it scale dependent is exactly the beta function, the fact that the coupling is running. And so they say that what you should do is basically see, is your potential badly deviating from 1 over r? Is your coupling running fast? Um, and if you just have a single charged particle, that never happens. You have this slow logarithmic running of your, of your coupling of your U1 theory. And so the symmetry is not badly broken at the cutoff. 
But if you have a tower of many particles and they're all running in loops, then you do bad badly break the symmetry. Um, and effectively what they show in this forthcoming paper is that you derive the same kind of um, tower weak gravity conjecture that we had discussed in earlier papers, which amounts to saying that the running of all these particles should drive your theory to strong coupling when you hit the, the quantum gravity scale. Um, okay, so that's my, that's my brief summary of their paper. And uh, what I want to emphasize is this idea of generalized global symmetries, which is a relatively new idea in quantum field theory, um, is paying off here. Because uh, if we ask that quantum gravity breaks all generalized global symmetries, not just the ordinary ones, um, and we ask that it breaks them badly, then you can actually derive things like some of these swampland conjectures um, from that, that hypothesis. So it seems like a well-motivated hypothesis. Harlow and Aguri give us some reason to believe that all of these generalized symmetries are broken. Um, and now the interesting new thing to try to do is to ask if we ask not just that they're broken, but that they're badly broken, what do we learn about particle physics? And it seems like this is one way to make progress and to derive some of these stronger swampland statements. So I think that this idea of generalized global symmetries is going to be really useful in the, um, in the next steps in the swampland program to kind of give us a more powerful tool than we have had so far. Okay. Um, so now I want to move on to talking about the ongoing work um, with Ben, Jake, Miguel, Tom, and Irene. Um, are there any other questions before I move on to that next topic? No? OK. Um, so what we've been thinking about is the fact that gauge theories seem to have very generically um, additional global symmetry. So what I showed you before was a U1 gauge theory has two global symmetries, one associated with conservation of F and one associated with conservation of star F. And thinking about those symmetries tells us that we need electrically and magnetically charged objects to exist. But in fact, gauge theories have additional global symmetries associated with them. The simplest one to talk about is in, a, in an abelian gauge theory, if df is zero, if we don't have magnetic monopoles, then we already know we have a one-form symmetry associated with f. But we also have symmetries associated with f wedge f. I can take d of f wedge f. And because df is zero, I can just expand this out and see that it's zero. And so if I'm in five dimensions, for example, um, this generates an ordinary uh, uh, zero-form symmetry. Um, if I'm in four dimensions, this is kind of a trivial statement because f wedge f is a four form. There's no such thing as a five form. And so d of any four form is zero. Um, I'll come back and say a few more things about that. But this depended on assuming no magnetic monopoles. And we believe that in quantum gravity, there are magnetic monopoles. So you might think this is not very interesting. We'll come back to it. It, it, it is a little bit more interesting than that, I think. But we get a more interesting statement if we go to non-abelian gauge theories. And in non-abelian gauge theories, it's a mathematical fact that D of the trace of F wedge F is zero. And this has been known actually since even before Young-Mills theory. This goes back to work of Xing Shen Chen and André Ve uh, around 1940. Um, it's at the root of the mathematical theory of characteristic classes. Um, but the derivation is, is straightforward. Um, it's basically that within this trace, I can insert these commutator terms of A with F without changing anything. And then I can rewrite these Ds of F as a covariant derivative, DA of F. Um, and the, um, the covariant derivative of F is zero by the Bianchi identity. So D of the trace of F wedge F is zero. In fact, D of F wedge F or F wedge F wedge F or any number of these uh, things wedged together is zero. So if I'm in high enough numbers of dimensions, I have these conserved currents that have k copies of f. Um, and they're all conserved because of the Bianchi identity. So these are global symmetries of non-abelian gauge theory. Um, and because this conservation law was derived by Chern and Vey, we're calling these Chern Vey global symmetries. Um, so that's a fact about mathematics. These things just exist and they're conserved. Um, and now that raises a, a question about physics, which is 
if these things exist for any gauge theory and they're conserved, how is that compatible with quantum gravity, which is not supposed to have global symmetries of any kind? And because these things follow from a mathematical identity, they follow from the Bianchi identity, it's clear they're not going to be super easy to break. There's not an easy way that I can just add something to the right-hand side of this equation um, and, uh, and break the conservation law. Now, in four dimensions, the trace of f wedge f is a four form, so the fact that it's conserved is trivial. Uh, and you might think that in four dimensions, this doesn't mean anything. We think that there's actually some coherent notion of what's, what we call a u1 global minus one form symmetry in four dimensions, which is related to the fact that this isn't just a conserved object, it's an object that has some quantization rules. So when I integrate this over a four manifold, I get some conserved charge, and that charge is the instanton number. But the story is certainly more straightforward if we go above five dimensions when these are just honest generalized global symmetries. In five dimensions, this is in fact an ordinary symmetry. Instantons, Young Mills instantons in five dimensions are particles, and this is just some charge that they carry. If we're in six dimensions, they're strings, and this is a one form charge that they carry, and so on. So we have these global symmetries. Quantum gravity has to somehow eliminate them, and we can ask how. So before I talk about quantum gravity, let me talk a little bit about a quantum field theory example, which is to take SU2 gauge theory and Higgs it to U1 by giving a BEV to an adjoint. So what's sometimes called the George Glashow model. And the George Glashow model has semi-classical Latif-Polyakov magnetic monopoles. Um, these things have co-dimension three in world volume, they're point-like particles in four dimensions, they're strings in five dimensions, and so on. And I can formulate a puzzle in this theory, which is that in the UV, I have a conserved four form current, D of trace F wedge F in the SU2 theory is zero. In the IR, I have a U1 theory. So I can ask what's D F wedge F, but D F is not zero because they're magnetic monopoles. So D of F wedge F depends on the magnetic monopole current and it's not zero. So I have a conserved current in the UV. I have a broken current in the IR. And I can ask, what happened? How did I lose my symmetry? Did the Higgsing process break the symmetry? Or uh, is something more interesting going on? And it turns out something interesting is going on, which goes back to physics of magnetic monopoles that's been understood since the 70s, which is that the tuff polyakov monopole has an interesting zero mode, or collective coordinate. So if I give you a, magnetic, a semi-classical magnetic monopole solution, there are obvious zero modes that just move the magnetic monopole around. They're translational zero modes. But it turns out there's a less obvious zero mode for the atuf polyakov monopole, which comes from doing sort of a U1 gauge transformation, which is non-trivial at infinity. So it effectively acts like a global symmetry. And the existence of this additional zero mode is known to be associated with a compact scalar boson, which I'll call sigma, that lives on the monopole world volume. So in four dimensions, the monopole is a point-like particle. It has a one-dimensional world line. And we can just talk, we can talk about quantum mechanics on that one-dimensional space. Okay, So we just have a time direction. We have a theory of quantum mechanics. Sigma is a compact boson, which means we're talking about the quantum mechanics of a particle on a circle. And that's a well-understood theory. It has a spectrum labeled by integers, which are just kind of exciting some momentum around that circle. Um, and it's known that in this context, what that does to the monopole is it turns it into a dion. So the integer is just the electric charge that the magnetic monopole acquires. Um, and correspondingly, this field sigma shifts when you do a U1 gauge transformation. And if we're in more than four dimensions, the same thing's basically true, but now our monopole world volume has higher dimensions, and so there's some quantum field theory that lives on that world volume. OK, so that's well understood physics from the 70s. The thing that's interesting is we can now kind of talk about that well-understood physics in a, in a somewhat new language um, in the following way. If I start with my SU2 gauge theory, it has this four-form conserved current, trace F wedge F, and I can gauge that current. I can add a D minus four-form gauge field C that couples to this, so that's sort of a Chern-Simons coupling. And if I can gauge that symmetry, then if I flow to the IR, I now have a coupling of C wedge F wedge F for the U1. But we said F wedge F is not conserved. And that's a problem, because a gauge field has to couple to a conserved current. In the UV, I coupled my gauge field to a conserved current. In the IR, if it just coupled to F wedge F, I would have it coupling to something that isn't conserved. And that's, that doesn't make sense. 
But what happens is um, F wedge F itself is not conserved, but there's a linear combination of F wedge F with something else that is conserved. And that means what this gauge field couples to in the IR is a linear combination of F wedge F and this localized term D sigma on the monopole world volume. Um, so in fact, that degree of freedom on the world volume had to be there or this degree just wouldn't make sense. It would be inconsistent to gauge this symmetry. Um, so what we have is some kind of localized uh, coupling that lives on the monopole world volume and depends on the sigma. And when it combines with F wedge F, um, it gives us something that is conserved and is a closed four form. So interestingly, you know, we've, we've been able to understand this old fact about quantum field theory in a somewhat new way. Now in the 4D case, again, everything's a little uh, marginal in four dimensions. It's, it's a little less clear what all of these statements mean, but I think some version of them still makes sense. And what is, a, what is a gauge field to gauge F wedge F in four dimensions? Well, it's really just a periodic scalar. It's an axion theta. And what we're seeing is that if we add a theta term to the SU2 theory in the UV, then in the IR, there's a coupling of theta to this uh, compact boson sigma on the monopole world volume. And in fact, that coupling is also a piece of old, well-understood physics. It's what implements the Witten effect, which is that if I have a magnetic monopole in the presence of a theta term, it actually acquires an electric charge. And it's precisely this coupling on the monopole world volume that makes the Witten effect work. Okay, so the whole theory kind of, the whole story seems to fit together nicely. The Witten effect is really essential if we're going to be able to consistently gauge this churn bay symmetry in the UV. Okay, so one thing that quantum gravity can do with these churn bay symmetries is gauge them. Um, so then they're not global symmetries anymore, they're gauge symmetries. That gauging happens through churn Simons terms. And in fact, that seems to be what string theory does most of the time with these symmetries. But the interesting thing is, in order for that to be true, there are also often these lower dimensional localized couplings that have to exist. And so there's a very rich story of how this gauging operates. Um, I want to briefly mention one concrete example in string theory, which is if I have gauge fields in string theory that live on D brains. Okay, so in gauge theory, if I take a stack of DP brains, put them on top of each other, I get a non abelian gauge theory. Um, on the world volume of the D brains, there is this conserved churn bay current trace F wedge F. And in fact, in string theory, we find that it's always gauged. It always couples to a P minus three form closed string field. Um, and so, so far that, that makes sense. Um, but then there's another twist to the story, which is that this field also couples to lower dimensional D brains. So it doesn't just couple to this trace F wedge F current localized on the DP brain, it also couples to DP minus four brains. And now we have a puzzle because if this was a conserved current, now we're not just gauging that current, we're gauging the sum of that current and some other current. And so we have two different conserved currents and you should ask what happens? Uh, if I had two currents and I only gauge one, I still have one leftover global symmetry, quantum gravity can't have global symmetries. So something has to get rid of the other one. Either there's gotta be another gauge field around um, or it has to be broken. And the answer here is that it's broken. And again, that goes back to some physics that's been understood for quite some time. It goes back to work of Witten and Douglas and Green, Harvey, Moore and others in the mid nineties. Um, and the answer is that in fact, these currents are not independently conserved because I can take a Young-Mills instanton that lives on the brain. The Young-Mills instanton is some big semi-classical thing. It has a size modulus, but I can shrink it. I can ask about the small size instantons. And as they become smaller and smaller, something special happens in string theory, which is the zero size instanton just is the same thing as a DP minus four brain. So I can take this instanton. It's, it lives on the brain because it's built out of the gauge fields that live on the brains. But when I shrink it to zero size, I can continuously turn it into a DP minus four brain and just take it off the brain. And the thing that's conserved in the bulk is really made of the same stuff as the thing that's conserved on the brain. They're continuously connected to each other. And so only this combination of currents is conserved. The other combination is just broken. And it's broken by the stringy process that we can't really describe in quantum field theory. It really depends on stringy physics. 
that these tiny instantons are the same thing as brains. OK. Um, so I guess I'm just about out of time. We started a few minutes late. So do I have, how many minutes do I have left? Uh, you, you can continue for, for a while, yeah. OK. How much do you um, need? Uh, probably just about five more minutes. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So I will I will try to wrap up pretty soon. So so one other comment about about the breaking of these symmetries. So we've seen that um, we've seen they can be gauged. We've seen they can be broken by these kind of UV stringy effects. Um, there's also a way that you can see they have to be broken in quantum field theory sometimes, which is if I start with a group like SU five and I break it to a product group like SU three times SU two times U one. There are more trace f wedge f objects I can make in this IR theory than I had in the UV. So some of them have to somehow be accidental symmetries that were not there in the UV. And in this context, the way that you see that they're broken is that if I want to specify, you know, what do I mean by trace f wedge f for SU3 in the context of the full SU5 gauge theory? Well, if I want to pick out the SU3 generators inside SU5, I have to insert Higgses. And so the current that from the IR observer's point of view, I would call trace f wedge f for SU3, from the UV point of view, is actually some higher dimension operator that has Higgses inserted in it. And that means it's not conserved in the same way because when I take D of that, D can hit the Higgses. And the derivative of the Higgses will give me non-zero contributions to the right-hand side. Okay, so this is another way that the Bianchi identity can be broken in the UV. That's um, not stringy. This is a pure quantum field theory thing. Um, and it means that an IR observer can overcount their symmetries. There might be things that you think are a symmetry in the IR that were not really symmetries in the UV. But what I want to emphasize is that this is a kind of special thing. So, so this doesn't, this can't just break any random set of symmetries. In order for me to break these multiple symmetries in the IR to one symmetry in the UV, I need them to be unifiable into a single gauge group in the UV. And so to summarize, um, there are these new symmetries. I mean, they're not, they're not new. The physics, the, the mathematics behind this has been understood since 1940. Um, but thinking about them as generalized global symmetries in physics is something that people don't seem to have done very much. And these symmetries, the churn based symmetries, are not easy to get rid of. Uh, they could be gauged, and they often are in string theory. And that's one explanation of why churn Simons terms are so ubiquitous in string theory. Um, Miguel and Angel and Irene had another explanation of that a few years ago, and, and so we're finding some of the same conclusions from a different line of reasoning now. Um, and sometimes they're broken by intrinsically stringy effects. Sometimes they might be broken by these field theory effects when they embed in the unified gauge group. But the number of options that we know of for breaking them is very small. Now, I don't know that we have an exhaustive list, but we've thought about a lot of examples, and the number of different mechanisms that work is very small. And so here's why I think that's exciting from the phenomenological point of view. Again, the 4D case is a little bit marginal, but I think we can make arguments that this, all of this logic should extend to four dimensions. And what that means is in a 4D theory, we have a lot of trace F wedge F terms around for our gauge groups. And there are very few options for how quantum gravity can get rid of them. One is by gauging them. And gauging in the 4D context means coupling them to axions. So I think one way to understand why string theory always gives us axions coupling to gauge fields is that otherwise there would be these unwanted symmetries and you've got to get rid of them. In the case where the gauge fields live in higher dimensions and we've just compactified to 40, this argument is even stronger. Uh, but I think it's true even for like gauge fields on D3 brains that are sort of purely four dimensional. Um, so I think this sheds light on why axions are so common in string theory, they're really needed. And it's also interesting because it tells us things that might be phenomenologically useful. So one thing that we worry about with axions is the axion quality problem. If I just write down a field theory realization of the axion mechanism to solve strong CP, I worry a lot that QCD instantons are not the only contribution to the axion potential. There might be some other instantons, maybe from other confining gauge groups. And they can give me new contributions to potential. And if those contributions are not very small compared to the QCD contribution, then I fail to solve the strong CP problem. Um, but within the context of these stringy axions, uh, if the goal of the axion is to get rid of an unwanted global symmetry, then we're actually in better shape. Because if these were two totally independent gauge groups, they have two totally unrelated global symmetries, and one axion cannot get rid of both. 
and we would need another axion to couple to the other group um, if we want to get rid of it by gauging. And then that other axion will get a mass from these other instantons, and then we don't have to worry about those instantons spoiling strong CP. On the other hand, it might be that the other combination of those two churn base symmetries is just broken, not gauged. Uh, but we don't know many ways to do that. It could be broken like in the gut example. But if it's broken in that way, that's very restrictive for the field theory, because that means QCD and this other group are somehow unified into a bigger group at high energies or somewhere else in the moduli space. And so that really restricts the kinds of couplings that can appear in the theory. It tells us the sizes of those gauge couplings are related somehow in the UV. Um, so it seems like thinking about things from this perspective, really, it doesn't totally eliminate the axion quality problem, but it reduces the number of kinds of things that you have to worry about. OK, um, so that's really what I wanted to say. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress in thinking about these swampland ideas. The minimal versions of them are always too weak to be useful for phenomenology. But I think we have increasing evidence that there are stronger versions of them. I think there are hints that these stronger versions are related to the fact that global symmetries have to be broken, not just a little bit, but badly by quantum gravity at the quantum gravity cutoff scale. Um, and I think uh, there are many kinds of these generalized global symmetries within gauge theory. I've been telling you about one kind, the churn base symmetries, uh, which people haven't thought a lot about before. And I think they seem to shed light on the existence of churn Simons terms and axions in string theory. Um, so I think in the future, we need to think more about what are all the generalized global symmetries that we could worry about? What does it mean for them to be badly broken? And what phenomenological lessons might we draw from the kinds of physics that are capable of breaking them badly? Thank you. OK, so thank you, Matt. That was a very nice talk. Uh, so we are open for questions now. Remember to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Anybody there? Okay, while some other people uh, finds a question, I have one. Okay. So uh, when you distinguish between the, uh, what you call the stringy breaking and the, um, and the breaking based on gauging, uh, for example, in the case, in the example of the DP minus four grains, mm -hmm. if I am a low energy observer on the world volume of the brain and I see mm -hmm. this instant on shrinking, I should see some effect in the low energy effectivity theory. Just the the higher dimensional operators that come out from integrating out the instant one should reveal the fact that this thing is going to be able to split off from the brain. I mean, when you talk about the stringy version, the stringy method of breaking, uh, is there a trace of that in low energy effectivity theory? That's an interesting question. Um... I'm not sure that I have a good answer to the question, but it's an interesting question. I mean, so so when we, you know, when we calculate uh, effects of instantons, we always have to integrate over the whole moduli space of the instanton, right? We have we have big instantons and small instantons, and we we need to add them all up. Um, I guess in QCD, the dominant contributions to say an axion potential come from effects around the size of the QCD scale, right? So it's the instantons that are kind of giving us IR divergences that are of order the QCD scale that are important. And small instantons don't matter very much. I guess this is somehow saying the effects of the small instantons when they become small enough are different from what you can see in field theory, but they're still there. There are these effects of these, of these DP minus four brains. Um, Maybe in the context of an axion potential, those effects are just suppressed and don't do anything very interesting. But yeah, I guess in general, I don't, I don't have a great answer to your question. But I, I agree. I mean, these 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 other these small size instantons where the UV completion matters are going to contribute some effects in the effective action. 
Um, and maybe there are cases where those effects are important. I, I don't know offhand. Mm -hmm. I have a, there is this paper of uh, Angel, Irene, and uh, Miguel called Chen Simon's Pandemia, I think it was the title. Yes. Which, uh, uh, what is the precise connection with uh, uh, your presentation? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the complete answer. Yeah, I, I mentioned that briefly on the slide. I think um, a lot of the conclusions are the same and that and that we're also arguing that these churn simons terms are necessary and here here we're saying they're necessary to gauge the churn base symmetries um that paper made some other interesting arguments it made arguments for instance based on um um thinking about sort of wrapping black hole horizons with with uh instantons and and compactifying things to lower dimensions and finding new symmetries i I suspect some of these arguments are related in some ways, but I'm not sure I've totally thought it through. Um, actually, I noticed that Miguel and Irene were both on the call. So do either of you have a better answer than I have to that question? Uh, not really, actually. Uh, I, we still have to understand. At least I don't see what's the, the it's what you said, right? There, there are arguments about global symmetries. Um, they're slightly different. And the focus is different. We had this focus on on trying to, um, uh, so there was a more of a focus on black hole entropy and counting black hole microsystems and getting the counting right, even when you allow the black holes to be wrapped by this uh, B field. Um, so that's not related to arguments in two dimensions, but um, I don't see any, I'd, I'd like to understand this better. I think there is maybe a difference, which is that, in that paper, we were thinking that it was enough to have the Charles Simons to break or gauge all the symmetries. Mm -hmm. Well, here it's precisely all the example that Matt described with the diodes, no, and, and the electric degrees of freedom and the monopole wall volume. It's, I mean, we are starting to discover that it's not necessarily the case that maybe you can add some localized no, uh, objects to break the symmetries, but then. In order to make it in a consistent way, they have to come you know, also with four volume degrees of freedom and other things. So it's like the step zero no, was just to use the churn segments, but how this links and how it, it what is the interplay with the localized objects is something that we are only discovering now, I think. Mm -hmm. nice. um, <clears throat> I would like to ask a question. Um, in, in general, the way we understand actions in uh, string theory is just as a consequence of the greenness bar anomaly cancellations. Okay, the Bianchi identity and the way the action entered into the original paper of Witten is simply a consequence of the greenness bar uh, mechanism of canceling the gravitational anomaly. This is perfectly consistent with what you are saying because it looks like if you don't gauge, if you don't introduce this action, the theory will be automatically inconsistent because it will be unable to cancel the gravitational anomaly. Um, In other words, the way originally, Witten was the first, I, I can be wrong, but I believe was the first to advertise that in a string theory we have always action. This is what is called normally the string action. And mm -hmm. this is direct consequence of Greenness bar mechanism. It's a beautiful result associated with Greenness bar mechanism. That is perfectly uh, in syntonic with what you are saying, because if you don't make this, this is what I want to ask. Okay, in what way you can extend your claim saying that, okay, you cannot have this sort of generalized global symmetries because we automatically induce gravitational anomalies. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Because essentially the action is the B field, and you know perfectly well how this enters into the green S bar mechanism. Okay, this is just a comment because this is the standard way we understand actions in string theory, right? Yeah, I agree. I think, um, so certainly if the axion is just coming from the B field, right? If the axion is the 4D dual of B mu nu, hmm. um, then there's a very generic kind of story associated with that. And it, as you said, it's related to, to green Schwartz. Right, right, because, you know, there are also many other places axions come from like Ramon Ramon fields that you integrate over cycles within the internal manifold. Um, this I is true. I don't there know. Are other type of actions. There yeah. are other type of actions. This is for sure true. But I don't but know if every I, example can be given a Green Schwartz like language. But but certainly the Green Schwartz examples are, are good examples and, and uh 
and I think, uh, yeah, there, there, there's some, it's the same you, can as them, you can again discuss them in this language of these turn-based symmetries, but right, I, I, I think, you know, everything we're saying, we're, we, we haven't derived any new physics and string theory. All we're doing is rephrasing known things in a common language that we think can be used. No, 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 I understand, I understand. Uh, another comment is, okay, some time ago we were just uh, together with Guy and some students, we were just claiming, or we were putting some arguments, uh, trying to argue the necessity of actions in quantum gravity. My impression, my personal impression, I put something uh, later of this thing, is that the general statement is that in quantum gravity, and this is related with your generalized, uh, probably your generalized uh, global symmetries, is that you cannot have consistently super selection charges. You see, the parameter alpha that enters when you put exponential alpha integral is like alpha n. Okay, then uh, in other words, these parameters that you introduce by these generalized global symmetries will play the role of superselection charges. What I mean by superselection charges? Think in theta parameter. Theta is a superselection charge, you don't have a coincidence. You don't have actions, theta will be a superselection charge. There is no way that you can make superposition, quantum superposition of theta one and theta two. In the moment you introduce the action, what you are saying to people is, oh, no, 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 theta is not a superselection charge. You can make superposition of theta one and theta two. This is what the action is doing. Essentially, the necessity of actions is simply saying that you cannot have superselection charges in a consistent theory of quantum gravity. This was my point of view some many months ago. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, th I think, you know, more generally, people, people say that quantum gravity theories don't have fixed parameters, right? And maybe theta is one example of that, but we sort right. of expect there are always these moduli that couple to, to, to couplings. Yeah, so, so that's... Yeah, but a, they, this notion of superselection charge is a mysterious notion, notion that we have for ages. A, a superselection charge means that simply that you keep the space decompose, and then you cannot make superposition effectively, except with time equal infinity, between mm -hmm. states living in different sectors. Now, I believe this in quantum gravity. This is what we did. I did with Gia, and I later I did uh, by myself. This is what we believe is the reason quantum gravity. Quantum gravity abhors uh, superselection charges. In other words, in quantum gravity, you can always make superpositions between uh, different Hilbert spaces. You cannot mm -hmm. split the Hilbert space into something that uh, you don't have superposition charges. Right. This was only my two comments. Okay, thanks. That's an interesting comment. Okay, are there more questions for Matt? All right. So if not, I give you the clap again. Thank you. And uh, I thank you for the uh, for this very nice talk. So thank you, everybody. Thanks again for the invitation. Very nice talk, Matt. Very nice, very nice. Thanks. And see you uh, in a few days, uh, okay? Thank you. So I'm going to end the recording now.